Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Had to take a break from celebrating Star Trek's 50th anniversary in June to talk about Graduation Day, but now we're back with the first comic for my favorite Trek TV series, Deep Space Nine. Although, as the Nitpicker's Guide to Trek series will point out, the Nitpicker's Guides, ensuring that you'll either be forever labeled a colossal dork, or just a smarmy know-it-all critic which means it's doubly effective on me. It's hard to call this Star Trek because there isn't a Trek going on. Well, sort of. See, it's time for backstory. The planet Bajor had just ended 60 years of occupation by a race called the Cardassians. They strip-mined the planet, tortured and killed millions of Bajorans, but now that they're gone, they've petitioned the Federation for membership. To oversee this, Starfleet sends out Commander Benjamin Sisko to act as their liaison, helming an abandoned Cardassian space station they now refer to as Deep Space Nine. To help the Bajorans trust the Federation, Sisko and his team locate a wormhole to the other side of the galaxy, the Gamma Quadrant, which also happens to be home to beings that the Bajorans worship as gods. Exploration into this region of space means that Deep Space Nine is a pretty important place, with commerce and political intrigue coming to it rather than them going off and finding trouble. Although they still would. And who'd have thunk it? The other side of the galaxy also has normal-looking people with bumpy foreheads. Truly a message of unity throughout the cosmos. As the show itself pointed out once, a starship has to keep zipping around everywhere and doesn't have time to develop long-term problems for their characters. Sure, there might be subtle arcs over time, but it was mostly standalones. On Deep Space Nine, you had to deal with stuff and see people change over the course of it. Sometimes that was good, like seeing a very angry former freedom fighter have to accept friendship and trust from outsiders after a lifetime of fighting. And other times it was Worf having a previously unexplored backstory where he accidentally killed a kid during a soccer game, and that's why people shouldn't be allowed to go on vacation. The point was that the characters were complex and interesting, and the plots sometimes intricate and advanced and heartbreaking. Deep Space Nine is glorious, not above questioning Star Trek's ethos and previously established utopia, and seeing what really makes it tick. I could go on and on about DS9 and how fantastic it is, but we've got ourselves another Star Trek comic to review. So, who is it this time? DC? Marvel? IDW? Well, it's none of them. So it turns out the license to DC had a bit of a loophole in it. They were only licensed to produce comics for the original series and the next generation. As such, Malibu Comics arranged their own deal with Paramount to produce comics for Deep Space Nine and any future spin-offs. More on that when we get to Voyager, but the point is that Deep Space Nine's first foray into comics was in Malibu Comics, which even had a ton of alternate covers for a while to try to take advantage of the speculator boom. This was 1994, after all. While this is the official first issue, there was an Ashcan comic given away as a special preview in magazines a month before the series officially started. But that's not what I have a copy of. So let's dig into Star Trek Deep Space Nine number one and see if the comic can live up to the quality of the series.
I'm not normally fond of the generic headshots on a cover, but this one definitely works if just for excellent composition. Your eye travels along all the faces well. The wormhole is the center of the cover and looks gorgeous. The logo isn't covering up anything important. There's some weird architecture in the background that looks like it's from the station, and at the bottom, Deep Space Nine itself. All around, this is pretty good. At the edge of the final frontier. Flat Earthers don't go far enough. I say the universe is flat. Fall off the edge of the final frontier and you end up in Star Wars. The only one missing from the cover is Dr. Bashir, who along with that Flesh and Stone comic we looked at last April, shows us another time where the good doctor gets screwed over. We open with a page that quickly shows us pictures of the main cast and their names to quickly introduce us to everyone. Commander Benjamin Sisko and his son Jake, Major Kira Norris, Chief Miles O'Brien, Science Officer Jedzia Dax, Security Chief Odo, Quark, Dr. Julian Bashir. And from the center square, Milton Burrows. And here's a two-page spread showing Deep Space Nine and the wormhole behind it. Which, instead of looking like a big blue swirl, looks like a massive explosion with an Oberth-class starship flying out of it. Michael Bay's Star Trek movie is looking great, guys. We truly open in the science lab, where Lieutenant Dax is showing around the children of the station, who are all in a class taught by Chief O'Brien's wife, Keiko. However, she soon notices two missing students. Wait, where are Jake and Nog? Nog said not to tell. They're back in the lab. They said something about trying to make a clone of Thor? Being idiot teenagers, the two are playing around with random unsealed chemicals. What do you suppose this stuff is, Jake? Ecto cooler. It's making another comeback for the 24th century. Maybe it keeps Lieutenant Dax young. My dad says she's 300 years old. My dad says she has some kind of worm growing inside her. Yeah, you're actually playing with its urine. Somehow Jake and Nog smash the chemicals together, proving that in the future, instead of using super futuristic materials that Star Trek has already established, like transparent aluminum, for sciencey crap, we're still using very fragile glass beakers that spill everywhere. Keiko and Dax enter, with Nog fearful that he's going to get hit, which makes me terrified to consider who's committing child abuse on him. I can't imagine his dad doing so, so probably Quark. Kinda fits with him even in his early appearances in relation to Nog. However, despite knocking all these chemicals on the ground, Dax confirms no one's gonna hit him and that he didn't mean any harm. Dax wants the two to help her clean up the mess. You know, once it's done eating through the carpet. Actually, what's strange here is that in the next scene, it looks like they've moved from the science lab into a cargo bay. The two start playing as they try to get past one of the doors. Captain's log started 46257.9. I've lost my toupee and girdle and I can't leave my room. Eventually, they do get the door open, but a bunch of melted ice cream comes flowing out. I told you we shouldn't have opened it. I'm going back to school. Next time, I'm captain. What's amusing to me is that eventually we're going to be reviewing a Voyager comic, and I just know that Nog is going to make captain before Harry Kim does. And I'm sorry that we have to cut away from two kids being idiots. After all, I know that's what people enjoyed Star Trek for, but there is a plot to the story, and we need to get it going. Station log, stardate 46257.8. And the plot is that they're clearly caught in some kind of time warp since that stardate means that this comic takes place before the show started. The oberth class starship that exited the dynamite-infested wormhole was the USS Armstrong, which was carrying a renowned archaeologist named Dr. Josiah Wembley. The Armstrong has returned from the Gamma Quadrant with a number of artifacts that are going to get transported to Earth. Because it's really going to be useful studying them on Earth, what with them being from a planet no human has ever been to before, nor do they have any knowledge of the planet or the civilization they found these artifacts from. Captain Johnson of the Armstrong wants to know if the artifacts will be safe. Chief O'Brien assures him they'll be fine. He's bringing them down to level 14, a.k.a. the place where the avocado pudding has been unleashed. However, when O'Brien brings the artifacts down, he's instead confronted by not just the goop, but also green gas that prevents him from breathing. Fortunately, he's able to call ops for an emergency beam out. Once in sickbay, he's half covered in green Play-Doh. Later, Cisco is of course curious what the hell this stuff is. Apparently, some kind of mold commander. We've seen something like it before. There was a strange report from the bounty hunter freighter Bebop. Apparently, the mold was sealed in that storage bay in a dormant state, and something got it to wake up. 
it's also spreading rapidly. My God, we could be out of hamburger buns for the annual Bajoran barbecue banquet. The mold is also taking in oxygen and expelling a toxic gas, not unlike how plants absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. No time to worry about that now, though. Constable Odo calls Cisco to report the mold overrunning the promenade. And given that they're in sickbay right now means that this should be happening right outside their door. Whoops. In Quark's bar, Quark himself is instructing his patrons to make an orderly exit and hopefully leave behind their winnings at his gambling table so he can pocket them. However, it seems the power behind the mold is Mark Summers, since Quark is quickly slimed by it. Odo, being a shapeshifter, changes into the form of a rat to burrow into the mold and then expand out to free Quark. Not that Quark is very happy about his rescue, since it means leaving behind his money. However, Odo is insistent, carrying off the little troll as he instructs a nearby person in the shadows to get to a designated emergency station. And the person in the shadows is revealed to be plain, simple, not a spy before he was exiled by the Cardassians at all, Garrick. And I know this is supposed to look sinister, but all I can think of is that this guy is a tailor, and yet stripes with polka dots? Dude, no. We cut back over to Ops. Apparently that stuff was first seen in the Hollow Arcade, sir. This is Commander Sisko to all stations. If you see a Pac-Man cabinet, shoot it. There are still people missing in the wake of the mold attack. And really, is anyone surprised that mold was responsible here? Cardassians prefer a warmer environment, probably very humid. Of course you were gonna get mold in the walls. Anyway, O'Brien can't spare any more personnel to search for the missing people because he's got them working to seal the ventilation ducts and atmosphere replicators to prevent the mold from spreading into them. I'm tired of taking defensive measures against that thing, people. I want some offensive options. If you don't have anything for me in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna go down there myself and start punching that mold until it screams, don't mess with the Cisco. I'm not even kidding either. Cisco is just that badass a guy. Q visited Deep Space Nine once, and only once, because Benjamin Cisco punched him. You hit me. Picard never hit me. I'm not Picard. Dax and Bashir arrive in Ops to report that the mold revealed genetic manipulation that's normally utilized by the Cardassians. Kira suspects it was left by the Cardassians when they fled the station as a sabotage attempt, but Sisko is unsure because it seemed to be activated by chance. It may be some kind of unsuccessful experimental weapon they left behind, or simply forgot. Of course! They were testing their deadly weapon to be employed in Federation bathrooms across the quadrant! The Armstrong hails them to say they're available for help, so Sisko has them assist in evacuating civilians from the station. Meanwhile, Bashir heads down to the habitat ring to speak with plain, simple Garrick, hoping he can press him for information about the mold. However, this is season one Garrick, which admittedly is one episode Garrick, where he's played up as smiling and overly friendly and, by actor Andrew J. Robinson's own admission, omnisexual, so he comes across more like he's hitting on Bashir than anything else. And of course, he denies any knowledge of the mold. Bashir heads back to the science lab to talk to Dax. Julian, where have you been? I was trying to help, but I've only succeeded in being beaten at chess, I think. Dude, you were playing chess and he was playing poker. You're not even on the same level. Captain Johnson is now being a bit of a dick since Cisco wants to have the Gamma Quadrant artifacts examined to see if they might have somehow activated the mold. It's not an unfair concern seeing as even they mentioned that the last time they brought on board Gamma Quadrant artifacts from that Q episode I mentioned, crazy crap like this happened. However, Captain Johnson is unwilling to even have the artifacts scanned, worried that a probe would destroy them, and refuses to admit the possibility that they could have had an effect. And that's why you're captaining a ship that looks like a coaster got wedged into a wishbone, Johnson, and not a friggin' galaxy class like Picard. Johnson decides to take his ball and go home, beaming back to the Armstrong with the artifacts. Although Dax says that if they were responsible, getting them away from the station is a good first step. Meanwhile, Bashir suggests that fighting the mold as if it was an intelligent enemy is foolhardy when they know nothing about it, instead thinking to treat it like well, mold. We've already modified several phasers to shoot soft scrub at it, Commander. I'm not too far off with that. They're gonna try a fungicide on it. Meanwhile, Jake talks to Nog about wanting to tell the others they're responsible for this because they opened a door? 
Or because of the chemicals mixing? I don't know. Not that it matters, and the discussion is tabled as we see O'Brien, Bashir, and Dax enter the quarantined area of the mold in containment suits. And then Bashir shoots some of the fungicide at the ground for absolutely no reason. Season 1 Bashir, a horny, naive moron who blows his load way too early. They find some of the mold, but Dax detects human life signs down a corridor. And for some reason, that means they have to stop themselves from shooting the fungicide. For reasons. Alright lads, if the flying wedge is good enough for Notre Dame, it's good enough for us! So baseball didn't survive into the 24th century, but football did? They clear a path using the fungicide to the lifeform readings, from an alien woman with a baby. Fortunately, she has been sealed in an airtight container, and being an alien probably didn't need as much oxygen. It, er, wait. Dax specifically said she detected human life signs. Then again, the crew is fighting against a menace that could probably just be stopped with some Lysol, so maybe they're not really at their best right now. Our heroes call for an emergency transport before the mold can force its way inside, and Dax gives her report. Unfortunately, the fungicide was only able to briefly repel the mold, not destroy it completely. They get a call from the Armstrong, from Dr. Wembley himself this time. Commander Sisko, is it? You think my artifacts are behind your troubles, do you? Not necessarily, sir, but as a scientist, you understand it's a factor that must be- I'm too old for all this talk! You can't blame your problems on my artifacts, Sisko! Goodbye! These objects I recovered from another planet are mine, and therefore are like unto my children! I'll kick your ass, Sisko! I don't even care if I break my hip again! Seriously, what the hell is up with this guy and Johnson? Why are they so adamantly against proving a connection over this crap? However, before they can call back, three Cardassian cruisers appear, led by the main villain of DS9, Gull Dukat. AKA, no seriously guys, this is pretty much the equivalent of Hitler. And so our comic ends with Dukat admitting that their scientists created the mold and demands to let his people on board the station to deal with it, promising that DS9 will perish if he's not allowed aboard. Not exactly making him into that threatening a villain when you realize he's come over here armed with sponges to clean up their bathroom. This comic is... okay. Nothing too interesting, but it's got a fairly solid, if basic, premise. Honestly, the only thing that kind of bugs me is the Jake and Nog stuff, since I didn't think it added anything onto this and would probably have been cut out if this had been an episode. The artwork is good, and while there isn't a lot of action, it's a pretty decent start for the Malibu Star Trek comics. Next time, it's another Patreon-sponsored review. And a bit of a weird one, since I'm going to be reviewing audio dramas. Yeah. Geez, Cisco is just having the worst day. His station is overrun with mold, a Starfleet captain is being a total ass, a scientist is being an even bigger ass to him, Cardassians are surrounding them. And you've got a whole lot of stressed out, overworked, underpaid, underappreciated human beings who just want the whole thing to make sense by the time they get to the office. <laughs> 